From the studios of Hub Radio Phoenix, it's the Jay Lawrence Show. Now, here's Jay. Good evening. Thank you so much for letting us be part of your evening. The studio audience, we've got 400 applause meters. Uh, CQ is with us. Constantine Carrard is our guest tonight. And uh, CQ is a consultant. And if I say to him, what would a consultant do? His answer will be consult. But <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get beyond that right away. When did you start and what is the job of a consultant, CQ? Oh, gosh, there's a there's so many types, I suppose. We're what they call a general consultant. And right. so we basically are running candidates, campaigns, issues, um, do a bit of public affairs stuff. But the idea is to take a candidate who says, hey, I want to get elected to office X and say, here's the process. And it's I always kind of liken it sort of you know, metaphorically to the football coach. Um, you have sort of like, are you the campaign manager? No, that's kind of more the quarterback. Right. Kind of the person runs the play, but the coach has drawn up the playbook. Um Kind of working with a campaign manager to help you win the game, and if you got a campaign manager who's a wily veteran, then you don't you don't need to coach him as much, right? If you got Peyton Manning back there, you know, let him audible. Uh, but if you got sort of a rookie campaign manager who's kind of you know, kind of learning as they go, then you really have to kind of script things more carefully. So it's everything from training candidates on on kind of how to be a good candidate, whether it's fundraising, knocking doors, um, working with the media. Um, issue, training, that sort of stuff, all the way through developing message, targeting voters, delivering the message. So you're talking TV, radio, online, direct mail, texts, you know, all the those campaign signs on the side of roads that people just love. And just all that. can't wait to can't, see can't, that. Can't, right. can't, can't wait to see what comes next year. Of course. So, super I, nuts. I know quite well how good you are since I ran as a candidate uh, three terms in the House of Representatives. I won three out of four, which is a good batting average. Way, unless, way better than average. Unless you're running for office. That four. That's, uh, yeah. But knowing well what you do and your advice to a candidate is just outstanding, just necessary. Um, setting up the meetings that you set up, the, the visits with the media, uh, knowing what to say, all that as part of your job as a consultant, really important. It is, and it's, it's not so much that you're telling someone what to say because you want a candidate to be themselves. You know, Jay Lawrence is Jay Lawrence. Uh, and obviously you needed a lot less training when it came to media than the average, you know, candidate. Um, but how do you present yours? How do you deliver your ideas so that the voter hears what it is that you're trying to tell them? Um, you have to be careful these days because everything's a gotcha, particularly with the media. And so you have to say things in a way where your message gets through, um, with just one possible interpretation. <laughs> they, they can't spin it, they can't use it against you, they can't try to kind of twist it and come back at you. And that's difficult because so many of the things we say could be taken more than one way. And so it's really a question of being short, succinct, um, and, and deliberate in what you say. Something I was never able to do. Deliberate, short, yes. Short, succinct. Ah. <laughs> the, the appearances I felt were important, the fact that a candidate has to get out, has to go out, shake hands, meet people. I think that's an important part of campaigning. It is, and it, and it helps, frankly, if you're a candidate who likes people. Um, we have yeah. worked with the occasional candidate who, you know, their, their urge to serve is strong, their qualifications are great, um, but they're not necessarily a people person. Uh, they're not necessarily comfortable in crowds. They're not, right. They don't know how to stand up and ask people to help them with something, particularly if that something is themselves. We worked with people who could raise... You know, they'll raise half a million dollars for a church or for a pro-life project or for something like that. You say, great, now go raise some money for yourself. And they just, they don't know how to do that. And so um, that sort of training um, can be helpful. It's just some coaching. You know, you're just, they have the skills. You're just telling them how. This is going to be a tough year for whoever runs. Uh, the Democrats and Republicans are so separated, so differentiated that you've really got to have a clear message you do it's um you know every every year every cycle i should say every two-year cycle it always feels like the stakes are higher the stakes are higher the stakes are higher and <laughs> really because i think it actually is right. we're, we're running out of time to fix certain things 
Um, and so we're going to need quality candidates. We're going to need to fund our candidates, which is something that Republicans are actually not very good at. Um, Republicans don't give to strangers. Um, there's a ton of money that came in to help Democrat candidates in Arizona in 2020. Most of it came from out of state, and most of it came from people that candidates had never met or spoken to. Um, Republicans don't tend to do that. We're, we're a little more distrusting in that sort of way. If we know you, if we've heard of you, if you do something that catches our attention, we'll give you some money. Um, but if I say, hey, there's 10 races that we have to have, right. send each of these people $25, you're not going to do it. Like, well, who are these people? How do I know? You know, we're, we, want, we want more data. So um, we need to find good candidates. We need to train them up. We need to get them the support they need, financial and otherwise. And then everybody has to execute. One of the problems in the financial field is the Democrats choose a candidate, and that's their candidate. They stick with a candidate and supply that candidate with the money he or she needs. The Republicans fight it out. And that's something that I think that the conservatives, Republicans, have to learn. It is, but it's, it's sort of the, the blessing and the curse. We live in a largely Republican state, historically a red state, um, and as we sort of have something to fight over. And so we have these, these contested primaries. Uh, the Democrats, who are kind of playing from behind, have historically said, okay, we can't afford a primary. We're going to save our money for the general. So you get to run for governor, and you're running for Senate, and, you get, and they kind of clear the field. Um, Republicans aren't good at that, and that's probably good. Um, we don't want party bosses picking our nominees because they're rarely going to pick someone as conservative as you or me. Um, you know, if it was their way, it'd just be always, it would always be John McCain or Mitt Romney because they can raise the money and the establishment wants them, and that's who they would just pick. And we say, no, thanks, we'll, we'll take primaries instead, thanks. Um, but when the primary is over, that's where we need to get better in terms of saying, okay, my guy won or my guy didn't win. Okay, if my candidate didn't win, we still need that seat in November. And so, or you, know, you can even give to candidates in other states. Um, Act Blue, Give Green, these are a lot of, of, of websites that the, the left uses um, where you can go and they'll say, hey, here's the state that's hot right now and here are the 10 races we need. And you say, well, I've got 200 bucks split it up among them. And the website will just divvy it up right. and sends it out. And so when you look at campaign finance reports from, you know, candidates running up in, you know, our, our legislative district six is up towards Flagstaff and, and uh, Apache County, Navajo County. It's a rural district. Um, Mayor of Flagstaff raised, God, I forget the number, but it was six or eight hundred thousand dollars for a legislative race. And so much of that came from California in small dollar amounts from people she'd never met. She's obviously not calling these people saying, can I have twenty five dollars? Right. They're finding her through other sources because they want to give, they want to help. And so that's one of the things that's not necessarily a candidate thing. It's more of a, hey, voters out there, um, when you're making your monthly budget, put something aside for political giving. You know, you do your church, you do your, you do your causes, put something aside. If you don't spend it every month, put it aside so it's there. Because at some point in time, a bunch of strangers are going to need that to win. You mentioned John McCain. There is still in Arizona a John McCain cadre, if you will people who still feel loyal to John McCain and the candidate that that speaks for John McCain is going to get a lot of votes. Um, yeah, they always talk about the McCain machine and right. there, politically there was, obviously he was a United States Senator, which is an incredibly powerful thing. You can be a first term United States Senator and you're an incredibly powerful person. Um, in, in raw terms, if you imagine uh, a United States Senator in their first six year term will vote on roughly $30 trillion in spending. Hmm. Okay, There's only 100 of them. So the powers that be don't take chances with who the senators are. So and there's a lot of power that comes along with that. There is a political machine that comes with it. But we always called it sort of the McCain machine, but I thought that was almost an inaccurate shorthand because I don't know that John McCain ran that machine. I don't know that the machine didn't run John McCain. So when we talk about the McCain machine I and, you know, to a degree, it still exists, even in McCain's absence, but I think it's largely because it wasn't McCain running the machine. It was the machine that had as its main instrument John Figure McCain. Right. Uh, and in his absence, it would move on to something. It was, frankly, it was Martha McSally to a large degree. Um, and now it'll be kind of who knows. Um, but you'll, you'll start to watch your candidates. And if you kind of watch how they speak, kind of see where the support comes from, see where the funding comes from. You can start to identify um, 
sort of the oh this is this is that candidate and if that's important to you then you know it's, it's something worth paying attention to money counts one of the things as i recall you urged me to rob stores rob banks <laughs> <laughs> rob, rob anywhere yeah. that, where i could reach over and hit the cash register okay. um the money counts and running as a clean elections candidate has to be the most difficult way to raise money. Yeah, for folks who don't know, clean elections is the public financing situation we have here in Arizona. Um, if we go back 15, 20 years ago, uh, it was something where the conservatives were like, well, oh, you hate this thing, public financing. Right. Um, but then conservatives got smart and they used it. And they used it actually to take the state to the right because um, the, the folks who actually needed help against the entrenched interests were conservative Republicans running against liberal Republicans. And so a lot of what we did 20 years ago was using clean elections candidate, uh, clean elections funding. Um, the laws have changed since then. The Supreme Court has thrown out matching funds and things. So it's kind of a, sh a bit of a hollowed out uh, feature compared to what it used to be. Uh, it doesn't provide a great deal of funding. Um, some candidates rely on it to run statewide if you're running for mine inspector or corporation commissioner, things that people just don't care enough to give you money for. Um, we have a mine inspector, but you've never given one money. Um, you, you may have given them $5 as a, as a clean elections contribution if you happen to be at a meeting where they were at. So some jobs or some campaigns rely on it, but it's a very small amount of money to run statewide. Uh, so in your race or any races like that, um, the money counts. It is Money's not everything, but money is message. Uh, campaigns run on time and money. That's, those are the two fuels that, that, that drive an engine. So if you've got 1,000 volunteers for your state house race, I don't need much money. These guys are going to knock you know, 100 doors each, and your message will be hand-delivered to the voters and not have to worry about it. Conversely, if you don't have a lot of time, you don't have a lot of volunteers giving time, now we have to pay for everything. Everything has to be delivered. It has to go through the mail. It has to be delivered. So if you have a lot of money, if you're Mike Bloomberg, you don't need volunteers. He paid right. everybody. <laughs> His volunteers got paid. <laughs> okay. Um, on the other hand, if you have a lot of volunteers, you don't need as much money. Um, but in most races, you're going to need some. There is a minimum amount you need. Boy, is that. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That minimum amount is a public indication that you have enough support that you're a credible candidate. Because let's face it, if you're, if you're all gung-ho and fired up, but you can't raise 5000 bucks maybe you don't have the support you need to win the race at the end of the day anyway. I found it difficult making the phone calls. I am not, uh, I'm not good at begging. Um, I think maybe there's an arrogance <laughs> a factor that I couldn't call up and say, hey, it's me, humble Jay. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes it's humility. It's, it's difficult to ask for money for yourself. You know, it's one thing if, if you were raising right. money for the Boy Scouts or you're raising money for easy, you know, some charity easy. drive, would it be like, hey, it's me, Jay. I'm doing this thing again. Um, you know, the mayor of Glendale, Jerry Wires, great guy. Um, he's got Jerry's charities. He raises a bucket of cash for a whole bunch of charities. He's done Shriner Kids, all those things. He's got this annual bowling thing. Right. And he'll break arms like, you know, did I get your, did I get your sponsorship for the team yet? You know, because he's raised money. Great, Jerry. Now it's time to raise money for you. You know, totally different, different way of approaching it. And one of the things we tell candidates, and you guys have to realize it, and I probably told you the exact same thing, you know, you're doing them the favor. You're the one running. You're the one who's going to be shot at. You're the one battling for all these good things. You're going to go champion their ideals. They owe you the money. You know, we always say to the candidate, listen, if you, if you want to convince a donor to give you money, make them this offer. I need $2,000. Or you run and I'll give you $2,000. No. I'm going to talk a little <laughs> bit further about that. Our guest, Constantine Carrard, CQ. And we're talking about um, elections coming up. Uh, it's difficult to make predictions because there's so many new districts, but we're going to ask anyway, straight ahead. When it comes to roof work, people ask, do you know a guy? Let me save you a little time and money. Call me. I'm Lori Clark, owner of Rightway Roofing. Our family started in the roofing business in 1963 on the promise, there's only one way, the right way. We protect your roof with thick, waterproof, rubberized asphalt, not felt paper. So when it's time to repair or replace your roof and you need a guy, I'm your girl. We're Rightway Roofing and we do it right. We'll always keep you water tight. 
This is a commercial for an auto dealership. Well, not really. It's a commercial for a salesperson at an auto dealership. The dealership is Wright Toyota on Frank Lloyd Wright. The salesperson is Jason Carter. I want you to remember that name, Jason Carter. My wife and I have bought our last six autos from him. I've sent relatives and friends to see Jason at Wright Toyota. If you're financing, Jason will work with the finance department to get you the lowest payments. Jason, here's what you're looking for. He knows what's there on the grounds. He knows where to find the exact automobile for which you're looking. And there's no time limit to his service. So there's no insistence that you buy the automobile he shows you. If it's a new Toyota or a formerly owned auto, any brand, any label, please call Jason Carter, 480-299-6474. Jason Carter, 480-299-6474. We're watching Jay Lawrence on Hub Radio Phoenix. How? <laughs> they love you. They love you. <laughs> How did they get all those people? That's right. <laughs> well, it's a huge studio. Take yeah, a look. Is. Look at that. It's enormous. Talking about the money. Once you call lobbyists, and we are all blamed for cheating. We are automatically blamed. If we get money from a lobbyist, we are told, well, you voted yeah, You voted for their product. Right. You're, you're considered compromised or right. whatever. Yeah. It, it is a problem. The, the appearance is, I mean, in truth of fact, most lobbyists don't give you very much money. Um, in large, there's 90, like in Arizona, there would be 90 legislators saying, could I please have money? And so they'll be like, well, here's 100 bucks and, right. <laughs> and a ham sandwich, and, and you have to report the ham sandwich. Um, so that really doesn't, you know, no, no one's going to move a vote for, for that kind of support. Um, but it is a challenge, and it's why you should raise money from basically everywhere, including just, you know, your, whoever's on your phone, you call and you raise money from your friends, your family, um, but at the same time, if you're a great vote, let's say you're a great free market guy and you open up an industry so that it can thrive in Arizona, no one should be surprised or shocked that that industry is like, you're great. I want to give you some money. Um, the money generally follows the votes. It doesn't come before the votes. Like they're not paying for CQ. I, paying I have for listened, a vote. I have listened to people from whom I've received money who have reminded me of the amount of money they gave and said, now, they didn't say it's up to you to pay back, but they reminded me, now, don't you recall I <laughs> gave you uh, $20? That's it. And, and then you went and voted the way you're supposed to vote anyway, right, and they're right. like, oh, well, that doesn't work. Um, like I think every part in any, any line of work, um, there will be corrupting influences Mm. Um, which are highly effective against people who are easily corrupted and completely ineffective against people who cannot be corrupted. And it's one of the reasons why we're always looking for quality people who can't be corrupted. Um, I don't care if somebody raises you $10,000, you're not going to do what they want because they raised you $10,000. And therefore, I like you and I would work for you and I would get you elected. Um, If you're sort of the horse trader down there, we're probably not going to be working with you. We'll probably be defeating you in the next primary because right. that's that's really not how it's supposed to work. I think it can work that way from time to time, and you hear about scandals mostly in other states. Um, Arizona, by and large, is you know we're, we're almost saved by the fact that historically politics in Arizona has been a fairly low dollar affair. You don't need to raise that much money to run for things like the legislature. Um, twenty twenty was kind of scary because so much Democrat money came in from out of state that the cost of running for anything has gone up. And that increases temptations. It increases the ability of the powers that be to start to assemble financial support in a way that makes a difference. Uh, but Arizona is still, we have a sort of a high quality legislature. Um, I mean, I know virtually every legislator down there. Sure. Um, and I have ideological disagreements with some, but I don't know anybody who's down there for self enrichment. What's you know. interesting is. There were some races. For example, let's take the sheriff's race. Joe Arpaio must have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. His opponent raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, big money in those races. There were a number of races where big governor's race is a big money race, of course. 
Um, there are other races where you don't expect hundreds of thousands of dollars to be spent, and yet there are those those races. So the a lot of it is scale. Obviously, the, much as I talked about the senators voting on on tens of trillions of dollars in spending, right. the governor of Arizona is a critically important position. I mean, it impacts so many things that there are any number of groups. Let's say you run a a Second Amendment group. Let's say you run an environmental group. Let's say you're involved in highway construction. Let's say you're involved in forest health. Let's say whatever it is, the governor is going to be involved. Who the governor is is going to make a tremendous difference in the quality of your life or the success of your business or whatever. So you're vested. You, you're you going to say, I like this person or I like that person. And you're going to send them money, not because they're going to do you a favor necessarily, but because this person will be good for this issue or bad on this issue. And so I want them to win or I want them to lose. So you have millions of people who care about that race. Um, the federal races, it goes beyond because if it's like a U.S. Senate race, you have national interests that care about that race. So while we talk about hundreds of thousands of dollars in these legislative races being kind of eye-popping amounts, um, let's look at that Senate race. Team Mark Kelly, which is Mark Kelly, the campaign, the, the, the DSEC, so the Democrat Senate Committee, right. the outside groups that spent for Mark Kelly um, were in the neighborhood of $140 million. The McSally team was in the neighborhood of $110 million. It's huge. That's talk, huge. It's a quarter billion dollars for a two-year rental. One race, two-year yeah, rental. Yeah, it wasn't even the full six-year term. Right. That was just to hold the one seat for two years. Right. But with it went control of the United States Senate. So how much was that race worth? Probably more than a quarter billion dollars. If you consider the, the trillions of dollars they're going to spend or misspend, or what would you as Republicans around the country pay to get that one seat back for two years? You know, so from that standpoint, we were amazed at some of these numbers. Uh, and I'm always sad because they don't call me. <laughs> was, was, you see that number? That was not a CQ's client. Um, but, uh, a million dollar uh, client. That is, that, is not my, no. that is not my client. Some of my clients have literally hundreds of dollars. Um, <laughs> if that. Yeah, that's right. But uh, some of those races are actually worth that when you consider what's at stake. Right. We, we talk about the billions of dollars we spend on politics, but as, an, as a nation we spend more on chewing gum and stuff. I mean, you always say, well, potato chips. There's all these things we spend so much more on than politics. And yet in terms of its impact on our daily lives and the freedoms we enjoy and the things that are at stake, politics is arguably substantially more important than... CQ, in the state of Arizona, we are now looking at... Now, first of all, we have redistricting coming up. Do we have any... When, when will we get results of redistricting? Yeah. So every 10 years, we do the census. When we do the census, we do reapportionment, which is where you take the population of the country... You divide it by 435, and that tells you how many House districts each state gets, which, of course, affects their electoral count right. for the Electoral College. Um, and then you have to draw the maps all over again. So in Arizona, we have 30 legislative districts. We have our population. The population between those 30 districts should be about even. Obviously, in the, since the 10 years before we did it last, a lot of these districts have seen substantial growth, particularly in Maricopa County and the rural, uh, in the urban areas. Um, so we've got to draw new lines for congressional districts, for county lines, uh, in terms of the county supervisor districts, um, for legislative districts, for city council districts. There's all these lines that have to be drawn. A lot of that's waiting on census data, which was held up about six months this time. And that's a, a real problem because instead of, we should be looking at maps now. Instead, we may not see early maps until September or October. And that's a problem because you want to run for office, but you don't know what district you live in. Right. You don't know who your incumbents are. You don't know if there's even a, a seat available. Um, and your signatures are going to be due April 4th of next year. So you may not know if there's a district to run in reliably until December or January, and then everyone's going to have to hustle. There's an interesting question dealing with Latino population. Will the fact that now there's been an amazing growth of Latino population, particularly in Arizona, Will the border problems that we have right now affect that Latino population? The border population Arizona has affects Arizona's entire population. Um, and we've worked with a number of, of Latino candidates um, who can tell you from their experience that if they go into the Latino community, uh, illegal immigration as a topic is not even a top five issue. Like it's number nine, it's number 10. They're, their real concerns are economic issues, schools, those sorts of things. 
Um, it's a bigger thing for the press uh, and what the press wants to cover for the Latino population than it is for that population. But the Latino population also has a substantial portion of it that wants a secure border, that feels the effect of, of illegal immigration because they tend to be in neighborhoods that are that are kind of suffering the greatest or if you live down on the border, um, you're suffering because your hospitals don't operate ERs. They don't have emergency rooms anymore because they've been overwhelmed by the people coming across for the free service. And so the hospitals can't afford to provide as required by law free service. So they just close the emergency room. Um, so if you're, you wanna have a baby, you have to go a tremendously long distance to find the ER that has room for you. Um, so it's, it's always gonna be a top issue until the problem is fixed. It's always gonna be a sort of a top two, top three issue to Arizona voters. That's still probably not a top three issue for Latino voters, but it would rank higher in Arizona with Latino voters than it would rank, let's say, in you know, Utah or Colorado or something like that with Latino voters. Will the question of legal and illegal come up with Latino voters? It does. I mean, again, it's because it impacts on so many things. If your concern is, you know, an overcrowded school, then the role that illegal immigration plays in overcrowding that school impacts. If you're, control, if you're concerned with, you know, crime, then that's a deal. If you're concerned with, you know, trying to get a job, but you're undercut by somebody who's not supposed to be. So illegal immigration hits on so many issues that if your top issue is health care or the environment, and you're concerned about what they're doing to the, the state, state and federal lands that are kind of just trashed by the, the amount of traffic that comes through. Uh, if you're concerned about, you know, education, health care, crimes, all those things, you're still touched by the effects of illegal immigration. So it is always going to be something that politicians in both sides are going to be talking about. Uh, Republicans in terms of trying to how to stop the problem, Democrats basically just race baiting and saying, "Oh, look, they're 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 racists." Absolutely. Um, that's it's still a, it's an important talking point to both parties. They both rely on that message to a great deal, um, and it still moves voters a great deal. Another question dealing in that issue: people moving from other states. Now we here in Arizona are a wonderful place to live. Maricopa County, what a wonderful place to live. And people are finding that to be true. Yeah, you, and, you, you need to stop telling people that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't commit. Right. No, no. Stay, stay home. 137 Wherever degrees. Wherever your home is. We can't play basketball. Stay there. <laughs> stay in California. Never mind that we're That's the right. finals. That's right. Forget, forget everything you saw. Right. Everything. It's not true. All right. The people from California, the people from... Chicago, who are moving here, they're moving from liberal states. The question becomes, how will that affect the voting here in Arizona? Do you think it will? It has already, um, and there's basically three groups. There are what I refer to as political refugees. So these are people who are fleeing blue states that have failed, and they want to come to some place that, that works. Right. And so obviously they've heard a lot of great things about Arizona, and Texas in particular, and so Arizona and Texas are booming. Florida's doing pretty well too. Um, so they're, they're headed to those states as a way of escaping what doesn't work. Um, there are kind of sort of stubborn liberals who are escaping a place that doesn't work, but they don't attribute it to the policies. So they come here and they keep voting for the same stuff that didn't work because you know, like some university professor explaining that socialism, socialism can work, we just haven't done it right yet. You know. Right. Um, and then there's the third group, which are the people who don't want to move to Arizona, but their company just moved to Arizona. And so that's, that's the thing when you see these companies that are, we're always celebrating, hey, this big company's abandoning California and they're coming here with 15,000 jobs. A lot of times they come here with many thousands of workers who move with them, who don't necessarily understand why the move is taking place. Um, and so- And they're Republicans not happy need, about the move. Not necessarily, but you know, they're gonna keep, they're gonna keep their, their old voting habits. So. Uh, we do need to do more in terms of educating voters from other states as to welcome to Arizona, here's why it works. And that's something that whether you're the governor or the Republican Party or any of these people, you need to be very proactive in getting to newly arrived people with that voter registration and the story that says this is why Arizona works. Please don't mess it up. <laughs> right. Try not to, but they will. They might. Um, I'm Jay Lawrence. Our guest, Constantine Carrard. CQ. Are you looking for a way to have your business stand out? Do you dream of turning on the radio and hearing a commercial for your business? 
or are you thinking of how fun it would be to see your company on TV in the midst of a Suns game? We have a big Suns game coming yeah. up. Hopefully, Hopefully. Then you need Kathy, the media maven. She can navigate all your marketing and advertising and broadcast needs. Why don't you call 602-524-0947 and watch your business grow. Whether in print, digital, or broadcast, Media Maven can put together a, a program to showcase your business. Call Media Maven 602-524-0947 today. This is a commercial for an auto dealership. Well, not really. It's a commercial for a salesperson at an auto dealership. The dealership is Wright Toyota on Frank Lloyd Wright. The salesperson is Jason Carter. I want you to remember that name, Jason Carter. My wife and I have bought our last six autos from him. I've sent relatives and friends to see Jason at Wright Toyota. If you're financing, Jason will work with the finance department to get you the lowest payments. Jason, here's what you're looking for. He knows what's there on the grounds. He knows where to find the exact automobile for which you're looking. And there's no time limit to his service. So there's no insistence that you buy the automobile he shows you. If it's a new Toyota or a formerly owned auto, any brand, any label, please call Jason Carter. 480-299-6474. Jason Carter, 480-299-6474. You're watching Jay Lawrence on Hub Radio Phoenix. Um, As carefully as they're going to have to. Right. Uh, And they'll they'll figure out what causes it. And there's some stories out in terms of some of the ongoing structural damage and some some upkeep that wasn't going on and some some rather telltale signs of of impending trouble. which is, but it, I mean, it's a, it's a horrible tragedy. There's no there's age. No. Age is going to play a part in an election, as it always does. Young people, for example, uh, young people in Tempe, the college students there, tend to vote very liberal, and more adult, brilliant people. <laughs> <laughs> like right. us. Graduates, right. that's right. <laughs> right. But um, your your senior, if you will, we we'll use the term anyone over 18 <laughs> is a senior. Did, yeah, as the population skews older, it tends to skew more conservative in, in its voting right. habits, um, which the Democrats take as a good sign because old people die first, and that will leave all the young people. But it ignores the fact that young people get older. And one of the reasons young people tend to be more idealistic, and frankly, if you're 18 years old, you're not spending your own money yet. Right. Um, my, my dad always said, you know, he became a conservative the day he had something to conserve. It hadn't <laughs> occurred to him to be a conservative up, up until then. Um, you get your first paycheck, you realize there's a piece missing, and you want to know where it went. Um, so as people age, it is experience that teaches them, that guides them. You know, they, they've learned more and more in terms about what, what works and what doesn't work. Um, Part of our problem, though, is the education system that has gone out of its way to kind of celebrate, let's say, socialism yes. versus the evils of capitalism and all that sort of things. That um, there's a lot of kids growing up with some really terrible ideas that have been reinforced over and over in their heads. And so, we need to be basically evangelizing all the time uh, on behalf of freedom, liberty, capitalism, and the the evil and inherent dangers of communism, socialism, and and its first cousin, fascism. However, there is a question. You have these college professors who have grown up in that system. They were educated by people who believed in a socialist system. They are walking into the classrooms and telling these young people, and in fact, they're making you take off a T-shirt that has some conservative message on it an American flag is suddenly sinful no, some some do but there are good colleges that don't and so parents need to be better consumers they need to send their kids to the right schools um, we argue on behalf of school choice at the k-12 level um, school choice exists at the college level so send your you know you you can go to Grand Canyon if you don't like what they're doing at U of A or right. ASU or NAU or some out-of-state school find a good school we can't send them all to Hillsdale. There's only so much room at Hillsdale. But, right. you know, there are schools like that um, that that will teach kids right. 
And so it's up to it's up to parents and kids to be to be better consumers. Which brings up an important point: Christian voters, religious voters, tend to be conservative, and that's almost a a, a generalization. I don't know that I can prove, but I feel that. Oh no, it's 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 it is proven. Yes. Um, it has to do with you know the number of times you go to church, how kind of devout you are in your faith. Um, so from that standpoint, yeah, there is. And a lot of it, it relates to family values. It relates to traditional marriage. It relates to uh, sanctity of life. Um, frankly, even to things like school choice and to basically anything where there is a right of conscience, um, whether it's with medical workers, whether it's with, uh, you know, there's various professions where we've done rights of conscience legislation here in Arizona. Um, morality, right versus wrong. If you have a party that believes that there is no right, there is no wrong, there is no good, there is no evil. We lose. Well, that, that, that party obviously is not going to appeal to a, a Christian voter or right. to, frankly, a devout anything voter. Um, so from that standpoint, uh, if you are a person of faith, most any faith, um, you are naturally going to be at home in a party that is filled with people of faith who believe in the freedom to worship, the freedom to believe the word of whatever their book is. Um, we see... We see the Bible being criminalized in other countries. Unreal. Um, and, and you start to see hints of it here. So whatever your faith is, you need to quickly embrace the concept of the Constitution and of liberty and the freedom of religion or you'll lose it. So from that standpoint, yeah, if you are, if you are someone of faith, you are more likely to be conservative. You're more likely to vote for Republicans. And that's... How do we go to young people today and tell them a message that is conservative is there a way to licorice that message? Is there a way to candy coat that message so that it becomes more acceptable to young people? No, and you don't have to, um, but I think it'll work better if you don't do it. And by now, even if I don't do it, I got, right. I got enough gray on my, can you see? I got some, got some gray in there. Um, <laughs> that means they're not going you to listen. They won't did, listen to me. That's brand new, that's by a, the way. That's, I've it's, never uh, seen that. Yes, a few of these belong to you. Um, <laughs> But uh, thank you so much. Right. Uh, but uh, there are young people who are talking to young people these days, and so whether it's a Candace Owens or a Charlie Kirk or the other, right. there's, there's a lot of groups out there that are doing this. Um, you know, um, I'm blanking on his name. Ben, uh, what's his name? Brilliant guy. He's got the palm guy. That it'll come to me. Um, they're they're going to college campuses. They're talking to to students directly, just kind of hitting them between the eyes with truth. And it's a simple truth. Look, the kids are smart. If you're in college, you know, you're, you're not dumb. You're in college, okay? Um, you're just not hearing a lot of truth. But you do recognize it when you see it. And it will cause discomfort, which can be fun because that's part of being in college is learning new things. You, you can often be open to learning new ideas when you're in college. So you get kids that are you know, from 16 to 26 or whatever. Um, there's a lot of imprinting still going on. There's a lot of impressions to be made. And so Ben Shapiro, there's my guy. That's it. Um, so these are the folks who are, who are literally touring college campuses to make sure that they're pouring truth into ears. Um, so support those efforts, support those groups, but let them do it. Because you and me doing it, they... They know what yeah, to expect. Like, yeah. The problem is younger than college. These college campuses are producing professors, teachers who go into the high schools and elementary schools and take a message that the parents really don't know about until they get a note um, from the teacher saying, we're having a, a, a group dance tomorrow in place of our history lesson. Yeah. Or and that, and what, do you, what do you do then? Again, we, we push for school choice. And right. you know, my, I've got three kids. They're all in... Um, They'll go to a great hearts uh, right. charter school, um, and they do a good classic liberal arts education, and they don't, they don't have to put up with that sort of stuff. So you take your kid out, and you put your kid in a good school. And if enough parents do this, then the schools that are doing a bad job will eventually collapse under their own weight, and the schools that are doing a good job will keep building new campuses. That's the point of school choice. Uh, but there are, keep in mind, a lot of parents who agree with the message that you and I disagree with, and so they'll want their kids in those schools. And so we're always going to have the battle of ideas, the battle of ideals. Um, good versus evil is real. 
That battle is never going to be over in this life. You know, this is, it's our, it's our job, it's our duty to fight the battle. And it's going to take place a hundred times a day in completely unrelated parts of your lives. So don't be surprised if you find it in your kid's school or a college or at your work or on your way home or on the radio or at a sporting event or whatever it is. It's going on everywhere all the time. We don't have to fight it every single time we see it because that'll wear us out, but we should make our best effort to fight it all we can wherever we can. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to go to a game and LeBron's there, I've got my free Hong Kong T-shirt on, right. and that's my bet. I'm still there to root for the Suns, and I, and I want to beat the Lakers, but I got goodness, you know, but I want them to see my free Hong Kong shirt, and that's my, that's my effort for the day. We just saw a, um, a young lady who placed third in an Olympic event and she stood far away from, she turned her back yeah, during was, the national yeah, anthem. Somehow, I somehow she was that, surprised to hear it was going to be played, which <laughs> right. this was apparently her first found, sporting event. I yeah. found that so unacceptable. And yet um, there are those who said, well, there's nothing wrong with it, turning your back on the, on the flag and, uh, and the it, national anthem. We, we live in a world today where everything's kind of blown. The best thing would have been just if everybody just ignored her because that's what you do. If you have a kid and they're throwing a tantrum, you know, you can spank them, you can ignore them, right. but, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily reward them with attention for it because it encourages more tantrums. Um, but you do something like that and there's a bunch of people on each side that will kind of either pile on or immediately make you a hero uh, which is unfortunate. You shouldn't get celebrity for doing something kind of as, as boneheaded as that. Um, if you don't love your country, why are you trying to represent your country? It's pretty simple. Don't do not do it. Um, but the good news is she was she, she finished third. You know, there's some good hammer throwers from some other countries. So the, the odds of her making an Olympic podium are, are pretty small. So she that's, did, that's probably the last anthem she's going to hear. Didn't look big enough to be no. throwing a hammer ever again. And, and to her credit, she was a she. So right. already that's that's all right. This is Jay Lawrence along with CQ, and I'm glad you're here. When it comes to roof work, people ask, do you know a guy? Let me save you a little time and money. Call me. I'm Lori Clark, owner of Right Way Roofing. Our family started in the roofing business in 1963 on the promise, there's only one way, the right way. We protect your roof with thick, waterproof, rubberized asphalt, not felt paper. So when it's time to repair or replace your roof and you need a guy, I'm your girl. We're right Way Roofing and we do it right. We'll always keep you watertight. Are you looking for a way to... Have your business stand out. You dream of turning on the radio and, and hearing a commercial for your business, or do you think how much fun it would be to see your, your company on TV in the middle of a Suns game? Well, then you need Media Maven. Kathy at Media Maven can, can navigate all those marketing and advertising and broadcast needs. Call 602 524-0947. Watch your business grow, whether in print, in digital, or on broadcast. She can put together a plan to showcase your business. Call Media Maven, 602-524-0947. You're watching Jay Lawrence on Hub Radio Phoenix. And our guest... Constantine Carrard, CQ. Let's look at the the uh, the elections coming up in the state. First of all, we have a gubernatorial gubernatorial election, and um, and that's going to be important. There are, I think, five candidates, if I'm not mistaken, four. Five five on the Republican side, two on the Democrat side. I, and I don't look and, at the Democrat and, side. And then I assume Barry Hess is running as a Libertarian. <laughs> As he always does. How how difficult will this be? Who's got the money? Well, no one's and filed finance reports yet, so it's going to be a while. But we know we, that we know Gaynor that has as much money as anyone in the race, and it won't do a great deal mm, of good. I I don't ordinarily I would agree that he has as much as anybody in the race, but uh, Karen Taylor Robeson, uh, um, yes, Mary, Mary Dad Robeson, who's Robeson Communities, and they, right. you know, I've I've heard something like. $15 million or something for the race. Um, so she'll probably have more money than anybody. 
Um, Gaynor obviously was a self-funder who ran for Secretary of State uh, in 2018, won the primary, lost the general, a pretty close race against Hobbs. Uh, Matt Salmon should be able to get out and raise a lot of money, and I know groups, some conservative groups like Club for Growth have already indicated that they're going to support him financially. So those would be outside groups. They do their own thing. So as a campaign, you don't really get any say in it, but it still helps. Um, Kimberly, who's a state treasurer, uh, is going to be out raising money. And then Carrie Lake, who's the uh, the former News 10, uh, Fox 10 anchor. Interesting. I saw Carrie, Leak, uh, Carrie Lake speak. Leak speak. Okay. Carrie Leak. I saw her speak at a uh, Paradise Republican Women meeting. And she was a great speaker. She was obviously a media-trained speaker. I don't know how much that will affect. And she's going everywhere. Yeah. Uh, she's, she's got I, a little Jay Lawrence in her. She's got that. She's got that natural. That, yes. that, that natural gift. Look, she's uh, she's a great personality. Um, obviously, she's she's used to presenting the story. Yes. You know, that's literally what she's done for the last umpteen years, um, and so she delivers delivers her remarks in in, in great fashion. Um, folks, folks generally seem to to like her. I have no idea how she'll do financially. I mean, that's probably very the biggest question mark because um, there's a fair amount of. There's some grassroots excitement. Um, she's kind of the, the non-traditional candidate, and right. we love non-traditional candidates. Um, and so the question is now, but can she raise the money to, to compete? Because being on being a local news anchor even for 20 years in, in, in Maricopa County doesn't do you any good outside of Maricopa County. And even within Maricopa County, you were number one. I think she was probably number one for most of her time here. Right. Um, but out of, I think, five or six channels, so there were still a fair number of people watching those other channels. So people who didn't watch her still know her name because they've seen her on billboards and stuff for 20 years. Um, but she still needs to introduce herself to the rest of the state, and that costs money. So um, we'll be curious to see what happens. Basically, at the end of January, everybody will file reports saying what they did through the end of this year. But we get no sneak peeks. We get no hints. Uh, if you're running for Congress, it's every three months. But if you're a statewide candidate... Uh, the off year is just one single report. So anything that happens this year, we don't know until next year. Kimberly Yee has never lost an election. Um, how will she fare in this one against Matt Salmon? I think they would be the they would be prime candidates. Yeah, they're from the Republican standpoint. Actually, really, every candidate is is a serious contender. Right. Um, Robeson's money obviously makes her serious. Yes. Um, Gaynor has won a statewide primary the last time, so he has a certain amount of name ID, and, and he has shown he can win a primary. Salmon obviously has been the nominee before, and he's been elected to Congress a number of times. Um, he's got a good solid base, LDS, a lot of, esta a lot of conservative support. Um, Andy Biggs has endorsed him. Ted Cruz has endorsed him. Uh, Freedom Caucus, a lot of that, that sort of stuff. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot, Club for Growth. Um, Kerry Lake, obviously, tremendous personality if she can raise the money. Kimberly has won statewide uh, as state treasurer. Uh, we actually used to we actually ran Kimberly's races when she was in the legislature, um, so we we know her. She's a hard worker, um, but now they all have to go out and tell a compelling story, and they need to raise money and they need to build an organization. How about the Democrats? Democrats, you have uh, Marco Lopez, Mario, Marco Lopez, I believe, who's um, a Southern Arizona guy, and then Katie Hobbs, who's the Secretary of State. Hobbs has been sort of gifted the, the audit they've been doing from the Democrat standpoint. Hobbs' first couple of years as Secretary of State uh, weren't good. You know, fair number of, of unforced errors. She didn't do a very good job as Secretary of State. Um, but then she became like this partisan warrior to attack the audit, which plays really well with the Democrat base. Um, so it's raised her profile. She's been in national TV a lot. There are a lot of national forces that want her to be a star. Um, you know, she's a woman candidate. She's, she's very hard left. Um, and she spent most of the last umpteen months basically attacking Republicans, and that's what they're looking for. Talk about so. the audit, CQ. How important is that audit? Will we ever get real facts from the audit? I don't know. Um, obviously, we hope so, uh, and, that's, and that's one of the things I've been careful to kind of just not prejudge. Right. And I noticed that the media has worked very hard to discredit the work of the audit before the work is done, in large part, I think, because if the if they actually come up with conclusions that are detrimental to the left, the left wants to have already disqualified the messenger. And that's what's happening and that's, now. That's right. what they're working so hard to do. But it's, it is ultimately up to the people who did the audit to produce a report that is legitimate, that is scientific, that is backed up by real stuff. 
they can make a claim, but then can they prove it? And that's always been the challenge. We've had challenges all over the country that we haven't been able to prove in a lot of cases because we can't get the data we would need to prove it. So we can't actually make a convincing case. We only have strong hunches and suspicions and confluences and so many coincidences that there's all this smoke, there must be a fire. Um, this is their chance to actually, having gone through everything, to say, okay, here it actually is. We can actually show you in a way that you can't poo-poo, you can't call a clown show. It's real data done the right way. Now, if they, if they mess it up, if they try to make a presentation that is not credible, right. then whatever they find out will be not credible, and that will obviously do a great disservice to the cause. Um, look, I don't know if the election was stolen or not. I'd like to know if the election was stolen or not. And I'm just as fine knowing that the election was stolen as knowing that it wasn't stolen. And it won't I make just, any difference. I would just, at this point in time, no. Yeah, but No matter what the Supreme Court decision it was be, today. It, no, and then frankly, swinging Arizona still doesn't, right. doesn't swing any totals. Um, but if there are problems, I want to know that we can fix them for next time. If there are no problems, then I want our voters to know that there were no problems because the left has worked very hard to erode confidence in elections as a way of keeping us home. And I'm, very, I'm afraid that we're falling into that trap by giving the story such a boost. We saw it in Georgia where you had people who should be saying the opposite, telling people, Republicans, telling other Republicans, don't bother voting, right. it's a rigged game, why bother? And, and But for a handful of thousands of votes, you just lost control of the United States Senate because you told your own people to stay home. And that's stupid. And we're not supposed to be the stupid party. We've got to be the smart party. Next important Secretary of State, that election, because the Secretary of State, if something happens to the governor, the Secretary of State becomes governor. Yep. And so, and we have three well-known names in Republican circles running for that office. So there's, yeah, there's four Republicans. The, the latest, uh, Bo Lane is an advertising executive. Right. He probably starts with, I assume, the resources to become a, a serious competitor, uh, but he'll start as sort of an unknown. And then you have three legislators. Legislators have sort of degrees of, of, of public awareness. Like sometimes you've heard the name, sometimes you haven't. Um, and, and how have you heard the name? With what have you heard that that's name right, that's right. related? It's positive or negative. So you have, right. you have Mark Fincham, who's a, a Pinal and Pima, kind of a Southern Arizona legislator. Uh, Michelle Ugenti, who, Ugenti Rita, uh, who's out of the Scottsdale area. Uh, Shauna Bolick, who's more in the uh, the Central West Valley, um, are the three legislators. They've all got pretty good resumes when it comes to election integrity things right. and, and bills. But now they have a problem, which is that most people never heard of them and they all have to go raise the money, and they have to make a convincing case. Some carry a certain amount of baggage, but it's up to the voters, you know, it's up to the opponents to make that clear. You know, pick me, I'm the strongest candidate. Um, that Now we're back to sort of the money thing. They've all got to go raise the money because they have to introduce themselves to probably 650,000 Republican primary voters statewide. And so if it costs me 50 cents to give you the message, and there's 650,000 of you, now I need to go raise money. So. People will know in their districts will know them. Who will know them outside of their legislative district? That's where the money is going to be required. They want to deliver their message. Again, whatever your message as a candidate, there's a reason you're running for that office. And if you could tell people that reason, if I could put you as a candidate in the doorway of every voter and you could have that conversation with voters, they'd probably vote for you. But 650,000 of them that's not going to happen. How can you get away with negative campaigning? Does negative campaigning work? I saw it work against me when someone said he's too old to serve. But yeah, it's it's a. I, I believe in contrast. Uh, right. Like if you are running against an incumbent, it is your duty as a candidate to explain to the voters why the person who's in office shouldn't be in office. If that person was doing a great job, you wouldn't be running, right? You don't just, you're not just an egomaniac running because you want the job. Right. So it is necessary when you're running against an incumbent to explain you need to vote that person out and replace them with me for this reason. Now, what you use, you know, should be a legitimate reason. It should but be But they're policy. running for an open seat. If it's an open seat, then you're basically making – most of them will only be able to afford to say, vote for me, I'm the best because. Right. Most of them won't have the money 
they can't afford to say a bad word about their opponent. They need to use that word to, to introduce themselves to voters. Right. The outside groups may come in with, with, with money to, you know, to, to hit somebody on, on some sort of baggage that they have. But my guess is, particularly in a race like the Secretary of State race, they'll be pretty polite with each other because nobody has the money to, to go negative. You see all the negative ads when you've got $100 million and you're running for the United States Senate. Right. They start punching each other in the nose a year early. Very quickly, just about a minute left, U.S. Senate race. We do have a race for uh, that Senate seat in Arizona. We do. Uh, Mark Kelly's back up for election, um, so he will he will not be challenged on the Democrat side. Right. Um, he has he's moved left of, of Kirsten Cinema just because he wants to make sure he he's fine with the party base. Um, that's not great for him for a general election, but Republicans need to have a candidate now who can win. Uh, there's Jim Lehman, who uh, an executive put put some money in the race. I've already gotten two pieces of mail from from Jim. Um, uh, General McGuire has gotten into that race. Um, Mark Burnovich, who's the attorney general, has right. gotten in, and obviously he'll have, he'll have a pretty good name ID. With a beard. He he's now got, has a beard. beard. Well, you know, the beard can work. <laughs> the it's, beard. Not, it's, it's, it's not for everybody, but some people do manage. We're playing music, which means we have done our job. CQ, thank you. Thank you to the huge audience. Absolutely, to all of you. <laughs> that gathered. And we'll see you next week at 7 p.m. here on Hub Radio. Good night, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>